Well, hi, everyone, and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. Today, we're going to combine three of my favorite topics for Friday Science. Obviously, science is one of them. The other is history, and the third is some of my debunking work. I'm going to go ahead and incorporate all three in this video. This is going to be the sinking of the Titanic and the Black Swan. Here we see some of the 700 survivors of the Titanic, which sank early in the morning on April 15, 1912. It struck an iceberg in its maiden voyage across the Atlantic at approximately 11.40 p.m. the evening of April 14 and sank about 90 minutes later. They were able to get 18 lifeboats off and save 700 people, but 1,517 people went down with that ship. The wreck was located in 1985, and many of us have seen pictures from the submersibles that are going down to it periodically. Now, this video is going to deal with the question of why did the Titanic, which was a brand new, state-of-the-art ocean liner, hit an iceberg on its maiden voyage from Southampton to New York? Now, in the first part of the video, I'm going to look at some of the myths that surround the Titanic and some of the suggested causes of the accident. Then we're going to have a look at the weather, the night of the sinking, and see whether or not meteorological conditions had something to do with it. So let's cue up the music and get into it. construction of the Titanic was that it was on a cost plus basis. In other words, the shipyard negotiated their profit and then the company paid for all the materials. It didn't make any sense to skimp on materials because the profit was built into the contract. Now another concern that's been brought up is the number of lifeboats. In 1912, the shipping lines and regulations considered the ship to be the primary lifeboat. Their attitude was that it was better to have a ship that had plenty of watertight compartments and was designed not to sink than to have a ship that easily sunk with lots of lifeboats. As a matter of fact, there's a report that Captain Smith, the night before the accident, said the ship could be cut transversely into three sections, and all three sections would float independently. Now, to meet this requirement, the Titanic had 16 watertight compartments, and it was designed in such a way that any four compartments could be breached, and the ship would remain afloat. As a result of this increased safety in its design, the licensure board let them get away with fewer lifeboats than they otherwise would have been required to have. Again, the idea was the ship itself was the primary lifeboat. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is the two lookouts in the crow's nest on the front mast. You weren't a boiler tender during the day and a lookout at night if it was your turn to have the duty. The lookouts were specifically trained and designated to just be lookouts. They were professionals. Now, there's been some talk about the lack of binoculars. At the time of the inquiry after the accident, a number of seafarers were polled on this, and it was determined that it was easier to sight ice with the naked eye than to use binoculars. Binoculars come with a limited field of view. Now, there are other concerns that were brought up at times, such as the dehydration of their cornea due to staring into the cold wind all night, but this is what they did for a living. I don't think that that was that much of a concern. Now, under normal conditions, if a lookout spotted a problem dead ahead of the ship, the ship would have approximately 20 minutes to maneuver around that obstacle. The Titanic, contrary to some reports, was actually quite a nimble ship and turned very nicely. The problem was, instead of seeing the iceberg 10 to 15 miles out, they saw it when it was less than one mile off the bow of the ship, and they did not have time to completely clear the iceberg, although they came pretty close. Unfortunately, their contact with the iceberg was a side swipe motion, and as a result, the single hull was breached and six compartments were ruptured. In a side note, there is a report that there was a coal bunker fire on the side of the Titanic that struck the iceberg. The coal bunker fire had burned for at least a week, 
prior to being extinguished at 2 p.m. on the Saturday. However, given the magnitude of the collision, the blow was fatal with or without the coal bunker fire, so it is probably not a contributing factor. What was a contributing factor may have been the weather, and that's the next part of this video. Now, to try and get a good handle on what happened the evening of the sinking of the Titanic, we have to answer two questions. Number one, why did the lookouts not see the iceberg until it was within a mile of the bow of the ship? And two, why did the Californian not respond to the distress signals of the Titanic less than 10 miles away? They were well within range to assist in the rescue of the passengers. The Titanic attempted to attract the attention of the Californian by using a Morris lamp and by firing off distress rockets, which went approximately 600 feet in the air. Yet the crew of the Californian did not respond. In fact, even though the Titanic was only 10 miles away and should have been clearly visible from the bridge of the Californian, they did not recognize it as the Titanic. They thought it was a much smaller ship sailing away from them. Now, how did that happen? This is a cargo ship in Norway or Sweden. Now, what's going on in this particular photograph is they're beginning to have this temperature inversion effect where they've got very cold water, warm air above it, and a cold layer of air just above the sea. As you can see, you can recognize this as a ship. However, that's the same ship. So is that. And so is that. As you can tell, these ships look very different. And this one actually looks pretty small compared to, say, that one. These are the kind of tricks that this sort of temperature inversion and superior mirage can set up to the lookouts in the California. This is another example of a temperature inversion causing one of these superior mirages. Now, if you look at this particular photograph, you would think that this is some small land masses with some cliffs behind it. However, look at the symmetry right along this line right here. You see how these, these areas look like they're mirror images of each other? The cursor is moving along the actual horizon. This is a false horizon due to refraction. The true horizon is actually down here. Now here's the problem you can run into with this. As I said, this is approximately the level of the horizon. If you have an object sitting in the sea somewhere in this area, this false horizon that is well above it from the temperature inversion and the mirage may hide it. Now with superior mirages, you can get things such as a feta morigana, which is inverted most of the time as this is. You can get looming where this land down in this area can appear to be higher up in this area. Another form of a feta morigana that you can run into is something called a feta bromosa. A feta bromosa is also called fairy fog. And it is an illusion where right at the horizon, you can get some fuzziness and some brightness that looks like a fog bank that's not really there, but it makes the horizon very indistinct. You can't tell the difference between the sky and the sea. Now this is during the day. Imagine trying to deal with this at night. Now one of the problems that the lookouts on the Titanic noted was that as they were steaming along, they saw what appeared to be some mist on the horizon, two points off the bow on either side. So it was a very small patch of fog directly ahead of the ship. The captain and crew of the Californian had made note of the fact that evening, it was very difficult to tell the difference between the sky and the sea, and the horizon was extremely indistinct. Now, to give you an idea of how bad this can be, here's a picture of two islands. There's a picture of the same two islands from the same location on a day with high refraction. The evening of the accident had weather conditions that produced this. 
it had very cold water, as I said, between 28 and 34 degrees, with warm air from the Gulf Stream right over it, and a layer of cold air just above the sea, setting up conditions for this superior mirage. Now, in the evening, you can see something that looks like this. It's called a feta bromosia. This is the indistinct horizon. Notice that it is brighter than the sea, and it's very fuzzy and indistinct in this area here. If there is an object sitting on the sea in front of this, with this in the background, you may not see that object until you're almost on top of it. Here's a graphical example of the same thing. The mirage is basically curling up the horizon in the background, and it can hide an object such as an iceberg right in front of it. Now recently, we've seen these images, so let's have a quick look at them. I wanna point out a couple of things. First of all, you see the very distinct horizon here? And look at the watercolor. You see how it's uniform? Now we'll also turn our attention to these two oil rigs. Do you see this platform or this walkway underneath the oil rig? And you see this flame boom coming out the side, relatively straight, that's clearly visible. Here's another oil rig off in the distance beyond the horizon. You see the flame boom is nice and straight and you don't see the walkway or anything under here. But let's look at this image. Now this image is interesting because as you can see, the flame boom is very badly distorted over here. Same thing over here. We see the walkway, but this looks like it's stretched a little bit. We're starting to see the walkway right at the horizon here. And the interesting thing about this is the bottom of this oil rig below that walkway rail right there is behind the water. Notice the different colors of water here. We have dark blue, we have very light blue, and then back in here we have a haze. And it's very difficult to tell the difference between the sky here, the water down here, and then this layer right here. We're dealing with the exact same effect, and that's this effect right here. So we had the dark water, we have the sky, and then we have this layer. We don't really know where the horizon is. It's somewhere in this band of this indistinct and blurred thing that looks like a fog bank coming across the sea, but it's definitely not sky and water coming together in here anywhere distinctly. Now, another problem that they had was routine procedures at the time indicated that if you had good visibility at night and sharp lookouts, you could proceed at high speed, even through ice fields, on the assumption that the lookouts would see the ice with at least 20 minutes of warning, and you'd have time to get out of the way. Now, the shipping routes between England and New York were very well laid out. They were very much like highways in the sea. Taking a ship like the Titanic was a routine event for many businessmen in Europe and the United States, some doing the trip once a month. It was viewed as kind of like riding a train. However, the problem that you ran into with the shipping routes is ice. Now, ice came from the coast of Greenland, mostly up in Baffin Bay in the Davis Strait on the west coast of Greenland. And then it flowed down, carried along by the Labrador Current until it meant the Gulf Stream down here. And you'll notice something very unique. You have very cold water coming down along the Labrador Current, carrying ice with it. And it doesn't intermingle well with the warm, salty water of the Gulf Stream. This sets up a rather unique weather condition. Now the route the Titanic took from Europe to New York came pretty much opposite the Gulf Stream right here. In this area, on the night of April 14th, there was an Arctic high, and as a result, there was an extremely clear sky and very cold weather coming in. The Gulf Stream water is extremely warm. It was recorded at approximately 54 to 56 degrees. The Labrador current water coming down was between 28 and 34 degrees. 
As a result, you had relatively warm air over the Gulf Stream coming over the Labrador Current, which was very, very cold water, setting up a layer of very cold air near the surface of the ocean. Now, when you have warm air over very cold, still water, it's very easy to get that layer of cold air just above the surface of the sea. However, did these conditions actually exist on the night of the sinking of the Titanic? Well, there's a couple of very good bits of evidence for that. First, British historian Tim Malton went back and checked all of the shipping logs for the ships that were in that area. As part of their routine shipboard activities, they would record the air temperature and the temperature of the sea every four hours and record it in the logbook. They would also make notes in the log of any abnormal conditions. Now, a ship that was very near where the Titanic was reported high refraction of the atmosphere throughout the day. And passengers and crew of the Titanic noted that there was a sudden temperature change as they were steaming along in the Gulf Stream and then entered the Labrador Current. For example, the ship's engineer noted that people were sunbathing the afternoon of the accident on the deck, and that evening, about 8 o'clock, they started having problems with fresh water lines freezing. So indeed, the conditions to set up mirages and high refraction were documented at the time of the accident. Now, one of the reasons the Californian couldn't see the Titanic's rockets and Morris light is the fact that due to the high refraction, they were getting a lot of twinkling in the stars, and this was noted in the logs of ships in the area, including the Californian. Imagine a hundred times this number of stars, all twinkling and flashing in and out. How are you going to pick out a Morris light? Using good historical detective work, Tim Malton tracked down the logs and the weather conditions on the night of the sinking of the Titanic, and it has a viable answer as to why a professional lookout crew did not see an iceberg until it was within a mile of them, and why a ship less than 10 miles away didn't even recognize the Titanic, much less the fact that it was in distress. So, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you very much for stopping by. Make sure you hit that like and subscribe down in the corner. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care. Bye.